Hello, it's time for English Composition, Section 3004, with your host, Mr. Fowler. I hope you're all doing well today. I've got my last summer uh, breeze outfit ready to go here as we move into the more official version of fall. Actually, I think summer goes until something like September 22nd, but most of the time, once we get beyond Labor Day, we sort of separate, I think at least mentally, summer from fall. So now we're kind of moving more consciously into the fall part of the semester, if that makes any sense. So uh, first and foremost, um, I wanted to uh, invite you to this session number six for us in course section 3004. I hope that things are going well for you. And today we're going to conclude our discussions regarding chapter three. I'm just checking a little over at my text here to make sure I have the right chapter number, but essentially visual arguments. We've got to lay this to rest. Um, primarily because next week it's going to be the fourth week of the semester, which means it's time to start generating some paper writing for the class. And let's begin with our standard course rundown. I'm going to use a share screen function and bring up our desire to learn homepage. Here I am in the upper right hand corner of your screen. As you can see for today, uh, session six, we're going to, uh, of course, engage in a little preview and review. You have a hyperlink here for how to use your text in order to develop questions for responding to visual arguments, specifically as they appear on pages 94 and 95 of your text, Practical Arguments, the short third edition. We'll be taking a little bit of a look at those uh, later in the class. Then I want to uh, talk with you a little bit, just about 15 minutes as an example, how to best outline your essay, the ad analysis. Now you may not wish to create an outline, but even if you're not a big outline writer when it comes to your paper topics, I want to at least introduce a couple of suggested ways to do that. Because if I can help you in any way prepare for the writing task of next, that are, awaits you next week, that'll be good uh, for me. And I think ultimately good for you. And then, of course, we'll close with some final thoughts and ideas. Uh, uh, just a five minute reflection, capitalizing on some of the things that we thought about today and anticipating how we can move from the analysis of visual uh, ads to actually applying that analysis. Okay, let's begin with a quick review. So when it comes to the review, last time we started talking about uh, visual arguments and we said that this chapter was designed very much in tandem with chapter two. Specifically, we thought about the ways that we could think and read a print advertisement or media advertisement in a visual sense. That means that sometimes we may even do things like highlight visuals. We may develop some ways, some strategies to actively read a visual. And we said that more often than not, visual arguments relied on some of the same uh, criticism points that a formal written or oral argument might adhere to. The difference is that we spend time on specific different visual elements, but we still start with one, identifying the argument itself. In other words, you want to contextualize what it is you're arguing about for your reader. 
that means explaining what the visual ad itself is describing thinking about the ways in which it goes about explaining those elements and then explaining what the ad itself has to do or say about a particular cause or call to action. In other words, you want to spend the beginning orienting your audience to the context of the rhetorical situation in which you're operating. Second, number two, you want to practice um, acknowledging the argumentative points that the creators of the ad, be it a media ad or a simple print ad, are setting into place. In other words, what is it they're arguing for? What do you feel that they want to get out of this visual argument? And who is the ideal audience for that visual argument. If you can identify those points, chances are good that you're going to be fairly successful at debating or agreeing with those same points. Now the third task is a little bit unique to ad analysis elements. You're going to want to describe certain visual cues and elements of an ad that are representative of the different types of concepts at play in said ad. In other words, how do they convey the message that they want to get across to viewers visually? And we said there are a couple of distinct ways that you could focus on an image. You could, generally speaking, look at elements like foreground, background, and color, any sort of descriptive text or fonts that are used to convey other meanings, and then of course um, anything that uh, would represent a visual uh, metaphor or analysis that you can use to break down the image and describe exactly what the originators, the creators of the ad, had in mind. To this end, we looked at a couple of examples from your text last time. We started real generally with this image, fairly provoking, of a young man, at least I think it's a young man, um, thinking about his actions and how they may or may not have been informed by media violence, specifically violence on this as represented on this television. Notice that in the background, of course, we have a sort of uh, television-like snow or um, static, whereas you have the black and white contrast of the child and his arm sort of runs off of the uh, image behind the television, but creates a uh, visual representation suggesting he might someday wield a knife much as he sees someone on television do, wielding a knife and that the result might be violence to a loved one or um, a, a creature of some type or other as represented by the teddy bear. Let's hope that that's not going to happen. But in looking at the striking visual images, the you know, dual, dual chromatic color scheme, the lack of actual visual text, the symbios or symbiosis, the symbology, okay, the symbolism of the TV and the juxtaposition of the boy's arm behind the television as it's uh, foregrounded, and then the teddy bear that's been um, mutilated on the the darker side of the scheme of the color scheme of the the design, all are elements that are worthy of inclusion in an analysis. We also spent some time with the Grand Theft Auto analysis, and this is a good one in your text to review if you uh, were not able to be in on that chat for some reason from last time, because it actually points out several of the visual elements that uh, are inherent in this text. 
And lastly, we spend a lot of time decoding silence the violence and how it uses uh, text, imagery, and metaphor in order to get its point across to its audience. All of those elements, by the way, are worthy of our time and attention when we're constructing an analysis of said visual image. Okay, so moving ahead, I did also mention that it may be a good idea to look at this checklist here on the bottom of page 94 and the top of page 95, right there. Okay, so those are in your textbook if you want to follow along with Mr. Fowler. And I want to talk to you a little bit now today about how to outline this concept. So I'm going to use the share screen function for a moment. And I'm just going to share a document with you. Okay. Hopefully you can still see me. Um, I'm going to bring the microphone a little bit closer here. I hope I don't cut out because that would be the opposite effect of what I would be looking for. So what I've done is I've taken these questions from page 94 and page 95 and I've broken them down into ideas or concepts that I thought best matched traditional interpretations of how to structure an introduction, how to structure a body, including, if you see it right here, the refutation. And then of course, how you may conclude this particular um, project. So the constituent pieces here should look familiar because they are in point of fact, the constituent pieces of what makes a good solid argument. So let's start from the top and look at the introduction. Again, the introduction is where you want to orient your audience to the general argument under discussion. To do so, I think that asking the following questions may help you ground your audience in a sense of comfort and invest a sense of ethos in you as the writer. So we're going to try to answer some questions as uh, follows. In what source did the visual appear? For what kind of audience, hostile, friendly, neutral, was the visual created? For what purpose was the visual created? Who or what organization created the visual? What do you know about the goals of the person or the organization under discussion? And what issue is the visual addressing? So the first thing that we're going to need to do is find a comparable image that we can use to apply to this outline. Luckily, I have just such an image in mind. You can find the same image on your Desire to Learn homepage under the content tab. While this is loading, I'll just give you a quick reminder. If you haven't yet ordered a copy of The Princess Bride, uh, you may want to do so relatively soon. We're going to begin our discussions about that later this month, in about two weeks, on uh, the 15th. So I think it'd be a good idea to have that text ready and available uh, when we begin discussing our, our novel. It's a shorter read, so I think that uh, having the text would be a good idea by that time. So here's the text. I'm going to make it a little bit larger for our analysis. Maybe not that large. Here's a text uh, for the Princess Bride. And as you can see, uh, we have 
some specific design elements to encounter or to, to, to weigh, I guess. It's a new film, new for 1987 uh, by Rob Reiner. It's called The Princess Bride. And we have a tagline. This is very often something uh, typical that you'll find on a movie poster. And it says, it's as real as the feelings you feel. We'll get back to that in a minute. It comes to us from Act 3 Communications and was produced by um, a, a number of people, including um, Rob Reiner, who also directed the film, Norman Lear, his sort of uh, mentor in the film industry, and then um, also uh, by Andrew Scheinman, Scheinman and a uh, screenplay by William Golden based on his novel, which is critical to, for us. Okay. Then we have some text at the beginning. We have an endorsement from Larry King uh, of USA Today uh, and CNN fame. Absolutely marvelous. This is as good as film gets. If you don't like it, you're legally dead, he says. That may or may not be the case, but he had strong feelings about it for sure. And then we've got a couple of pieces of text. Scaling the cliffs of insanity. Battling rodents of unusual size. Facing torture in the pit of despair. And True love has never been a snap. So that's our text. And then we have these sort of cyclopean pillars, okay? Huge, okay, in, in, in light of the two human figures that are framed within them. I think in a, in a purely aesthetic sense, we would call these iconic pillars um, of, the, of the Greek style. Uh, not a Corinthian column, okay, not a Doric column, but um, an iconic column for those of you who may be interested in art history. Uh, we also have in the, floor, in the background here um, a fairy tale castle with a bannerment flying. Okay. And then in the extreme foreground of the image, uh, behind these uh, mountainous cliffs in the clouds, we have the picture of an old man in a rocking chair reading a book to a young boy who's clearly a fan of baseball. We can see the cap, the bat, and the baseball itself. And he's listening intently as the grandfather tells the story. There's also a couple of unusual elements given the sort of fantastical uh, backdrop here. We have this toy robot. Um, and a skateboard laying on the first step of this, I don't know, Palazzo or something like that in the sky. So if you've seen the movie, you know that these two characters are part of the framing device. And there are versions of these two characters as well in the book. And what we will discover, I think, is that although the film is designed to focus on the story of the Princess Bride, the book, and by extension, the way that you see the movie after you've read the book, it's actually suggesting that the story is the frame device for the reality. Um, but the poster does not do a very good job of selling this movie. <laughs> so we have some information that we can use to complete this outline. Let's try to fill some of that in. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to my share screen and I'm gonna go back to my outline. And I'm gonna say, okay, in what source does this visual appear? And I'm gonna type this in here. Um, let's see. The visual appears in one uh, or as a poster or in a poster for the film version of The Princess Bride.
Okay. Um, we could say a little bit more about that. It was the original film poster um, for the for the film, but exists as part of a much larger uh, frame or ad campaign for the film, which is considered by many a classic. Notice that we haven't even described the visual yet itself. This would be an additional uh, component that we could add to the process. So we could say something like, um, two figures uh, sit, one in a rocking chair, reading a book, reading from a book. The other is sitting up in bed, but they appear to be in the midst of a fantastic palace out of a fairy tale. In the background, a castle, the, uh, the floor and these, the floor and these, uh, banner uh, ruffling in the sky. appears amid uh, cloudy mountains or cloud covered mountains. On the steps, um, below the two figures, Articles such as a baseball and bat, a toy robot, and a neglected skateboard represent the fading uh, sense of reality that surrounds these two figures as the world evaporates into a fantastical space. Fantastic. Maybe we'll just have to settle for fantastic. Okay, there we go. Okay, so that's a pretty good general description. And again, I spent maybe 10, maybe 10 seconds just kind of coming up with that. Now again, obviously Mr. Fowler has a little bit more practice with this sort of thing, but you could do much worse than that. And just in 10 seconds, we've come up with something that's it's, it's a fairly good description of the, um, the issue, the, the art, the uh, visual in, in question. All right. The visual appears in the poster for the film The Princess Bride. It's the original poster for the film, but exists as a much larger part of the ad campaign for the film, which is considered by many a classic. For what kind of audience was the visual created? The general audience for the film um, could be uh, anyone. Realistically, the film does uh, contain 
a notice that rates the film for a PG-13 audience. So ideally, or what, we shouldn't begin with a, um, with a uh, uh, what is it? Conjunction. I'm going to say ideally, the audience would constitute anyone ages 13 and over. And again, we don't want to use the number 13 um, because MLA asks us to type out any number under 100. And we also don't want to end on over because it's a preposition. 13. Um, uh, aged, so anyone aged 13. And beyond uh, and and older. That's not a preposition. Anyone aged 13 and older. Okay. For what purpose was the visual created? Well, luckily we can save some time as Mr. Fowler was fumbling with that last bit. We can say um, the poster was designed to advertise the film adaptation of the Princess Bride. And I'll capitalize the T and use some italics because the names of books, the names of movies, and the names of albums in MLA and the names of magazines are all italicized or underlined. It's your preference. As long as you're consistent, we should be okay. Who or what organization created the visual? Do you know what the goals of the, uh, of the person the organization are? In this case, we do. The poster is, was designed by Act 3 Communications, uh, representing the producers of the film. Rob Reiner, um, Norman Lear, and I can't remember the other guy's name, so I'm going to do what good researchers do. I'm going to go back and I'm going to check. All right, because I'd rather double check than be wrong. Share screen, Princess Bride. And the name was Andrew Scheinman, S-C-H-E-I. Okay. Alrighty, and we can go back and correct the other uh, piece there. It doesn't recognize the name Shyman, but that's all right. We can add it to our properly spelled list later on. What issue is the visual addressing? This is tricky because this is where a little bit of interpretation comes into play. So Mr. Fowler's interpretation may be different from yours. And it will certainly be different if you're choosing to tackle a different topic. But I'm going to suggest that the film poster advises audiences that sometimes um, an experience can be invested with more meaning than a uh, specific interpretation or text actually has to offer. 
And as you know, throughout the text version of The Princess Bride and its film adaptation, it's more about the grandfather and the grandson spending time together and making a connection than it is the actual story of Wesley and Buttercup. But because they share a unique experience, because that uh, story mattered to them as characters, it matters that much more to its audience and the connections that we form around the story. And that's what's beautiful about stories. They have connections that change and um, alter for us as we get older, as we reread a text or revisit a story. And specifically, that's what's true of fairy tales and why they're so popular and why they continue uh, to pass on from one generation to the next. It's because we come to those stories from very different perspectives throughout our lifetime. And they create meaning when we share them with someone else. All right. So at this point, you could argue that most of what we've set up in an introduction covers these discussion points from your text. This would be a good way to approach any kind of ad analysis that you might be interested in pursuing. And I think it would also be a nice way to establish for yourselves some of your principal and original thoughts. Now, obviously, I've had it all summer to sort of design this response. And it may seem more off the cuff in my illustration, but obviously it's something I've pre-planned and, and worked through with other students and uh, that I've worked through myself to some extent. So I feel like if you struggle with this a little bit, that may be a more natural response. So don't get hung up on the fact that you might struggle a little bit more than I am in this example, okay? Now, let's move on and complete this analysis. Okay, as we move into the body, what position does the visual take on the issue and how can you tell? Now, this again could be the thesis statement revisited, but I feel like this stands as a better potential thesis statement. So I'm gonna outline that in blue. The film poster advises the audience that sometimes an experience can be invested with more meaning than a specific interpretation of text actually has to offer. The film's tagline, it's as real as the feelings you feel. Also part of the wonderful theme song that was developed for this movie. Um, suggests, nice word there, Mr. Fowler. I like that you brought something in there. Um, so the film's tagline, it's as real as the feelings that you feel, suggests that the uh, creators of the poster and by extension, the film itself, are creating a, uh, an adaptation that reveals um, a belief in the power of storytelling. I like it. Do you agree with this position? That one I'm gonna leave blank because obviously Mr. Fowler has his own interpretation but here you would set up a yes and or a yes but, not bit, a yes but um, uh, analysis, okay? So real quickly, just as a reminder, yes and versus yes but, what does that mean? 
Generally, yes and means I agree. Yes but means I disagree. I feel that using the yes and, meaning the authors or the creators of the ad in this case, have a good point or they raise a good argument. And I think that there's more to this. I can add to their perspective through my personal experience. Yes, but means that I acknowledge the creator's position or the author's um, contestable idea as well put and um, certainly valid to an extent, but I have a different interpretation or I have a slightly, what I feel is, as a writer is a slightly better uh, take on this particular issue. Okay, so that's what a uh, yes and a yes but um, reference refers to. Okay, does the visual include words? And if so, are they necessary? Okay. The poster does have quite a bit of text beyond referencing the film's title. Uh, there are four specific lines of writing. The first, which is um, scaling the cliffs of insanity. tells us about one of the pivotal locations in the film. The second, battling rodents of unusual size uh, suggests a fantastic element that is, you know, uh, piques the audience's attention or curiosity. The third, facing torture, uh, in the pit of despair. By the way, little preview for you, the pit of despair in the novel is referred to as the zoo of death. Which is better? I don't know. I'll, I'll let you think about that. The third, facing torture in the pit of despair um, suggests an element of danger. The final uh, text scrawl or text crawl reads, Finding true love was never a snap. This is intended to explain that the film has love story elements. Um, elements of the love story. Okay, so the text gives us quite a bit. What points do they make? We kind of combined both of those together, so I'm going to go ahead and, and skip over that one. What does the visual need? More or different written text? Um, I'd say that that's uh, okay, you know, I, you know, I feel that the written text on the poster is effective in its attempt to intrigue, to bo or both inform and intrigue, can't type today, 
the movie going audience it was designed for which it was designed quick aside again would it really matter if I had written for for whom it was designed or uh, who it was designed for probably not but in the strictest sense in formal written English you should try to avoid ending a sentence with a preposition that's really stodgy old kind of writing uh, a practice but Mr. Fowler has to prep you for the potential that you might have somebody in your future who regards your writing as less than proficient because you end a sentence with a preposition on occasion. So try to avoid it or try to be at least conscientious of when you do it so that you don't do it as frequently perhaps as you might normally. It's a little food for thought. Okay. Uh, does the visual seem to be a refutation? Here again, Mr. Fowler will say, yes, that the tagline, notice I hadn't talked about the tagline yet. Uh, suggests that even though the film is a fantasy slash comedy, there is meaning in, for everyone in this story. To argue that the film's central messages are as real as oops not real in that sense real as the feelings that the audience feels in real in real life invest invests the story and the and its accompanying image With, re, with um, a sense of grandeur, and grandeur. Okay, gotta use spell check. Ah, D E U R. Probably a French word with the, uh, in, in terms of its origin, in terms of the inversion of the syllables here. A sense of grandeur. Um, and real quickly, since I made this, and you saw me make this change, I added a comma here. And I added a comma here. Because this is what's referred to as a specific type of clause, right? This is a clause where the information isn't necessary. It's extra information. So it's referred to as a non-essential clause, not, not surprisingly. So non-essential clauses are welcome additions to writing, but you have to put them in context with a comma before and after them if they're in the middle of a sentence here or if they come at the end of the sentence just a comma preceding them. I like to tell students to think about it as like an ice cream scoop, right? You could take the comma ice cream scoops and just scoop them right out of the sentence and it would still make total sense. But they do add a little bit of flavor and fun to the meal of a sentence if you follow that food metaphor. It is almost lunchtime for me so maybe I'm I'm a little hungry. I don't know. Okay. So um, I'm just going to finish up this thought. The idea of the film seems to be that 
the storytelling experience is oftentimes more important than the story itself. It's not about the destination, it's about the journey, right? to use a cliche. So for the conclusion, is the visual effective? Is it attractive? Is it clear? And is it convincing? Well, it's a little bit of variation here. The film poster for The Princess Bride was one of the most, um, you know, what, polarizing elements of the film. It is at best vague. This is especially true for uh, audiences unfamiliar with the original text. With Golding's, uh, Goldman's original novel. It's especially true for audiences unfamiliar with Goldman's original novel. The presence of the, of the grandfather and his grandson are um, confusing for uh, many film goers, um, especially as they function primarily as a frame device for the actual uh, story within the story. Noting that there were several follow-up posters redesigning this original uh, underscores uh, this notion. Additionally, these other posters almost always neglect to include the grandfather and his grandson. So is it visually effective, attractive, interesting, clear, convincing? I would say no, <laughs> based on our analysis. Now, a couple things to point out. Correct that little S in the posters. So just looking at the questions that were originally designed in this um, outline and looking at how much we wrote as a response to this outline. You can see right here uh, on the bottom of the page, we've got a word count. And just to make it a little bit more uh, easy to see, 698 words. I believe this assignment is rated for 600 words or uh, two and a half pages. So if you were to double space this, um, let's, just, let's just practice that just for a, mu a minute. Oop, I don't even have to do that. What am I doing? Home select all and let's just drop it to a double space just out of curiosity. Okay, yeah, we're like on a third page. Okay, and if we could restructure these questions as um, introductory sentences, you would end up with something approaching an appropriate length for this paper. And we just spent uh, the space of a single class time, roughly, uh, uh, 
creating this, uh, not even the space of a single class, uh, creating this outline. And we already have the assessment well in hand and uh, we're able to, I think, tackle a project like this with a little more certainty. So even if you broke this process up over two days and restructured the questions into introductory sentences or perhaps even topic sentences per paragraph, you would come up with a fairly decent introduction with a substantive thesis, number one. Number two, you would have a body, a series of body paragraphs describing the elements uh, that made up the visual. You'd have enough to formulate a paragraph out of the refutation. And then lastly, you would have a fairly good conclusion that you had built into uh, your outline. And extrapolating those constituent components into a formal paper would take um, very little time. And again, you'd have something very appropriate for the scale and scope of this project. So I hope that was somewhat helpful as an exercise. By the way, the template that I used, that I filled out here, it is available on Desire to Learn right below the uh, section discussing the original poster and uh, trailer for The Princess Bride. Next week, uh, if you would like me to do this, I'd be very uh, pleased to go through this process using the trailer, the, the, video, the uh, mass media version of this process and what the trailer has to offer. Uh, that would be pretty, uh, pretty easy. So let me know if you're interested in that. We also have an outline available on Desire to Learn that's a more traditional outline. Many of you who took 104, or excuse me, 103, will find that it's a carryover from that class. So if you're already familiar with that, you're, you're set, you're good to go. You don't have to worry about it. And you'll know how to use it and interact with it. That will also be posted on Desire to Learn so that you can have a sense of how to access and utilize that outline. And it's just a standard sentence style outline that you can apply to whatever uh, needs are um, necessary. Okay, that's pretty much it for Mr. Fowler today. I'm just about out of time for this session. Oh. So let's just dip back real quickly into our class. I'm going to get rid of that and go back to uh, the Princess Bride. Oops, I think I got the I deleted the wrong thing. That's okay. So um, the point is for today, now that you have a sense of how to outline this project, you can begin next week to, uh, with confidence Find an outline or find a, a print or media ad that you like and apply the same practices to that advertisement. And the resulting analysis will be something I think you can uh, stand on as an argument for how visually successful or uh, you know, unsuccessful that ad was in getting its audience to understand your initial or understand their initial uh, premise in designing the article, in designing said advertisement. Now, don't forget there are a couple of things to handle this weekend. I want you to take 15 minutes of your time uh, this week if you haven't done so already and just set that aside so that you can answer a couple of questions. What kind of ad are you thinking about writing about? Are you considering writing about? What other kinds of questions or concerns do you have after watching both of these videos this week? And then lastly, what else do you need to know about this assignment in terms of how it is you'll be evaluated? Answer those questions in your discussion forum. And if you have time, go ahead and 
check in and see what some of your fellow students may be planning to write about. Drop a comment if you're interested so you can earn the maximum amount of points for the discussion question for this week. Remember that the draft of this project is due in a short 16 days, Friday the 18th of September by midnight. Hopefully you will have plenty of time given the, the uh, available hours between now and then to generate a draft of that project. I'll take a look at it, revise it, send a copy back to you, and we will look for that revision around or before the 25th of September, before we move on to bigger and better things. Okay, that's all for today. I hope this was helpful. Um, if you need some more information or you need me to cover a different aspect of this topic, Oh, as always, reach out to me. Until then, uh, thank you so much for your time and your attention today. This is Mr. Fowler bidding you, number one, an excellent Labor Day weekend, and number two, a great rest of your week. Take care, everyone. We'll talk again on Tuesday.